looking at uh, Missouri S&T or, or departments in general. Um, I can just tell you a little bit quickly about me. I won't spend a lot of time, um, but probably much like you, uh, I had never heard of material science and engineering when I was an undergraduate student. I started out at the University of Minnesota in electrical engineering. And after two years in electrical engineering, I decided uh, that definitely wasn't the field for me. But when I was looking at engineering, I really only knew electrical and mechanical and civil and chemical, um, you know, and that's pretty much about it. I'd never heard of any of the others. And uh, there are a lot of other small uh, engineering disciplines out there. And uh, there's some really great fields. And we think we're, we're one of those. And uh, it was really my love of chemistry, um, but wanting to get an engineering degree that drew me to uh, material science and engineering. And I would say that in particular, if your passions are chemistry or physics, but you really want to apply that into an engineering field, we do a lot of physics engineering and we do a lot of chemistry engineering uh, in material science. It's not that we don't do math. No, we do math as well. In fact, there's a lot more computational stuff going on these days. Um, but ultimately, I landed in material science and engineering, and I'm glad I did. I never looked back, got my advanced degrees in this field, and uh, I really love uh, teaching our students. And uh, like I said, I've been here for 23 years, and I've been department chair now for almost uh, four. So I'm just going to run through a few slides, and then we're going to let the students, uh, you know, uh, come in, join in, and talk to you guys a little bit, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So... I want to let you know that, um, you know, we do have, um, you know, the students that have already introduced themselves have mentioned that they're either in metallurgical engineering or ceramic engineering. Now, in most universities around the country, um, they've changed over to a material science and engineering undergraduate degree. So what's the difference? Well, we still strongly feel here at Missouri S&T that our students get a much better hands-on education with separate metallurgical or ceramic engineering uh, programs. And these are both ABET accredited. Uh, programs in engineering, which makes uh, our students very highly sought after uh, by particularly ceramic and metallurgy companies, but all the big companies that hire materials folks will hire our students uh, as well. All right, so what's the difference between us and uh, programs that do a lot of material science? Um, they learn, teach their students a little bit about ceramics, a little bit about metallurgy, a little bit about polymers, and uh, really they've cut out a lot of their labs. And I'm not, I'm not speaking uh, on that uh, from uh, anything other than experience. I know uh, a lot about what those other programs are doing. And uh, I think we have a very, very good hands-on uh, set of programs here. Metallurgical engineering has been around since 1873, right? So it's really been around since, uh, you know, the, the, the founding of this university. Um, to put that in perspective, we're basically 150 years old, right? Ceramic engineering has been around since 1923. All right, so 50 years later. Again, they're both ABET accredited and they've been accredited since 1936 and we just got accredited again. We're primarily an undergraduate program uh, until the mid 1960s, meaning that uh, our faculty largely just taught classes. And then the university really started doing a lot of research uh, when they opened up the Materials Research Center uh, in the 1960s. And uh, we became a comprehensive university and started doing a lot of research. In fact, we're the number one research department on this campus. We do more research than any other department, including the largest departments like mechanical engineering, and we do more research dollars per faculty. What does that mean to a potential undergrad? It means opportunities for working in the lab for a faculty member doing research, right? So there's uh, chances for, for jobs there, and there's also opportunities if you want to go on to grad school. Um, at that time, you know, the department kind of refocused uh, in some, some areas that we still work in, electronic ceramics, uh, glass composition and properties, high temperature materials, uh, crystallography, advanced processing, lightweight steels, advanced refractories, which are high temperature materials, um, and uh, a lot more. And we're still doing all these things today uh, and many more. In fact, uh, we uh, have the most faculty that we've ever had uh, in this department in the history of the department. Um, just a snapshot, looking at the size of the department, you know, fall of 2020, uh, we had 237 total undergrads. You compare that to some place like uh, our mechanical and aerospace engineering department that probably has a thousand undergrads, All right? Our computer science program probably has over 700 undergraduates, you know, so are we the smallest department on campus? No, we're not. In fact, we're one of the largest material science and engineering programs in the country. And really, that's just because we, we tend to do a pretty good job attracting students uh, to our department. And uh, so it's a it's but it's not an out of control number. 
It's a very manageable number. I'll get down to the, to the student to faculty ratio here in a minute. Keeping in mind that we have two separate programs. Right now, there's 55 metallurgical engineering students in the program and 118 ceramic engineering students. That's just counting the sophomores, juniors, and seniors, because it's a little harder to track the freshmen, all right? Because the freshmen all come in here at this university and they take a common core and they really don't uh, officially join the department until they're done with their, with their intro uh, freshman program. But roughly speaking, I've got about 44 metallurgical engineers in the freshman uh, program right now and 20 ceramic engineers in the freshman program. So traditionally, we've tended to have more metallurgical engineering students than ceramic students, but we've got some pretty big cadres of ceramic students coming through uh, right now. Um, I can tell you this, they're all getting great jobs. Um, you know, the job market is, is, is amazing in materials, uh, both metallurgical engineering and ceramic engineering, and it's even better in metallurgical engineering than it is in ceramics, but they're both really good. All right, so I'm glad to see this number coming up. Um, you know, we could use some more metallurgical engineering students. I'll be honest with you, I can't graduate enough of them for the job market, but we don't have a problem placing our ceramic students either. There's 67 graduate students in the program, and this is just to give you some perspective. We certainly have master's and PhD programs in the department as well. And again, that's where a lot of that research is taking place, although the undergraduate students do research too. There's 18 metallurgical engineering graduate students, 15 ceramics, and we do allow the students, if they want to say have their degree, say material science and engineering, they're allowed to do that. That's just their choice. And so 34 of those graduate students have selected uh, for their degree to say material science and engineering. There's 18 full-time faculty, eight in metallurgical engineering, 10 in ceramic engineering. That's normally switched as well. All right, so we're a little heavy on the ceramic engineering side compared to metallurgy, um, but uh, it's, a, it's a great group of faculty. The undergraduate student to faculty ratio is 13 to one, all right? And that's, and that's pretty good, all right? So it means, uh, you know, we've got a, a reasonable number of students um, for, for our faculty. And I don't know why this thing's not letting me advance. <clears throat> there we go. Quickly, uh, ceramic engineering, uh, which you know, you've probably never heard of before, and that's one of the reasons you're here tonight, involves the development and production of inorganic non-metallic materials, such as glasses, things like fiber optics would be an example of a glass product, silicon carbide, which would be one of many high temperature ceramics, uh, electronic ceramic materials, solid oxide say fuel cells um, would be one example, capacitors might be another. Certainly we're doing a lot of stuff in the biomaterials, biomedical field as well. That's really a growing area. The way to think about ceramics, as you guys are wondering, you know, a bit more about what it is. If I take about any metal on the periodic table and I turn that metal into an oxide, a carbide, a nitride, or a boride, I've made a ceramic out of it. So I just pick a metal. Pick aluminum. Everybody knows aluminum is a metal and make, make cans out of it, right? Aluminum cans. I add oxygen to that, I make aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is a very good ceramic material. If I add nitrogen to it, I can make aluminum nitride. If I add carbon to it, I can make aluminum carbide. And I can even make an aluminum diboride, right? So all of those borides, carbides, nitrides, and oxides would be ceramics. Sand, great example of a ceramic. Silicon dioxide. You and I could go to a nice beach, pick up some nice, clean, pristine sand, these students that you've got on the call with you, like Will and Noah, they know how to take that and turn that into a ceramic product. Could also turn it into a, um, you know, a, a, a silicon-based material, which some people would say is a metal, but actually silicon as a product tends to be more of a ceramic product, right? Behaves a lot more like a ceramic in a lot of ways. So this is showing you how to take silica sand. And if you read through all this, and I'm not going to bore you and read it, read it to you, but if we reduce that, that oxygen out of there and made electronic grade silicon out of it, turn that into a single crystal, and then spun it and pulled it, we could make a giant pool of single crystal silicon, which we would make silicon wafers out of. And those silicon wafers would be the basis of the, all the DRAM, right, and, and the main power, power unit in your computer. Right, and so before we developed this really, really pure silicon, right, computers weren't anywhere near uh, the capability and speed that they are today. So it's a ceramic product. And I could have chosen just about anything to put in this slide. We could have talked about cell phones. Um, you know, we could have talked about, you know, other electronic components. Just to give you an idea, metallurgical engineering involves the development and production of metallic materials, such as cast iron and steel, aluminum, titanium, copper, Right? And we're pretty much dealing with all of those here at this university. 
As an example, we have got one faculty member in particular, Dr. Motes, who's an expert in copper. And I just picked this slide for fun. It's not one I go through very often, but you know, if we take ore, all right, if we go to our mining friends in the mining department and tell them we need some ore that's very high in copper, we would take that and we put that in a crusher. We'd crush that down to size. We'd put it in a ball mill and we would comminute that material and try and break it down to some fine size, right? And then ultimately we would put that into some kind of a chemical process where we maybe would remove a lot of the things that we don't want. We want to make the copper particles that are in there as pure as we can. And then we're going to put them in a smelter and we're basically going to smelt them, right? We're going to get rid of the slag that comes off the top and we're going to take the nice, you know, fairly pure copper material off the bottom, all right? And we're going to basically convert that and we're going to basically melt that is what we're doing and we're putting that into a mold and we're going to make anodes out of it right so we're going to make they're fairly pure but they're not pure enough to make you know 100 pure copper and then we're going to put them in an electrolytic solution and we're going to replate from those anode plates to a cathode so you can basically just think of this as a giant battery if you will all right and uh, we're going to we're going to plate pure copper uh, onto the cathode and then we're going to take those pure cathodes and you can make products out of them Right? We can make copper wire, you know, ship those off to a company that's making wire, making pipe, making cookware, you know, making, you know, copper for rubes for houses or whatever. I'm going to delay here for one second and see if I can, oh, maybe somebody else has admitted the student. <clears throat> I think we still occasionally have students sitting in the waiting room, so I apologize. I just want to give you a quick, quick look at where our students go. Um, you know, and this is just a small snapshot. I'm going to show you a couple more slides, but just an example, I just picked a few, you know, companies, you know, you've certainly got, you know, car companies like GM, you know, you could have put Ford on here as well, you know, uh, aerospace companies like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, you know, you got national labs like Oak Ridge National Lab, the Naval Research Lab, I could have put Sandia National Lab on here, the Honeywell Kansas City plant up in Kansas City, that's why I've got Honeywell sitting over here, they hire a lot of our students. You know, big ceramic companies, St. Cobain and Kohler, lots of metal companies. I probably didn't put enough near enough of those on here, but certainly, you know, Caterpillar makes a lot of products out of metal that use metals. Alcoa, I should have put Nucor and, and Gerdau and, you know, a few other steel companies on here as well. Uh, but certainly companies from all over the globe. Here's a snapshot from uh, about 2000 to 2018, about the last time we took a good hard look at the data. This is where all the ceramic engineering bachelor students went. All right, so you can see they go all over the country. You'll see universities listed on this chart as well. Um, and that's because those students have gone on to graduate school. All right, so we send our students, uh, frankly, all over the world to go to graduate school. We've sent students as, uh, to, to Oxford University um, in, over in the UK to go to grad school. All right, so uh, our students go on to grad school and they go on to very high paying jobs um, all over the country. And the way to think about this with material science is look, Everything in the world is made out of a material. Everything. It's either a polymer, a metal, or a ceramic. So we enable all the other engineering disciplines. All right. I mean, if electrical engineering wants to make better electronic products, they need better materials. If mechanical engineers want to make better mechanical products, they want to make a better car, they want to make a better airplane, they need better materials. They need lighter weight materials, they need stronger materials. We enable every discipline. Chemical engineering needs better materials. Civil engineering needs better materials, right? We've got faculty that are studying all of those materials. And so any company that makes any product out of materials is gonna hire a material science and engineering person. Now, do they hire as many as they do mechanical engineers? No, okay, but they still hire them, all right? And they've gotta have them. So you see all sorts of ranges of companies on here. Where the metallurgical engineering students go? This is that snapshot, all right? So. Again, you kind of see for both of them, kind of a, we're a bit more concentrated in the Midwest, but there's still a run of companies on the East and West coasts. You know, you know, California doesn't have to like to have a lot of steel plants. All right. So you won't see too many steel companies out there, you know, but you see the big ones like, you know, all the new core steel companies and Gerdau and the likes, uh, Steel Dynamics. Um, you still see uh, Arsler Middle probably listed on here somewhere, but they've been bought out uh, by Cleveland Cliffs. So is AK Steel. Right, but uh, these are the companies where they go. All right, lots of companies all over the United States, including the big oil companies. Right, so the big oil companies will come hire our students. Exxon Mobil, I could have put Chevron and Phillips uh, on here as well. 
uh, they'll, they'll in particular come and hire our students because we still teach our students corrosion metallurgy as well. And that's very important uh, to that industry. Average starting salaries for the students, fantastic. Uh, this is just last year's numbers, uh, 70,300 for metallurgical engineering, 66,250 uh, for ceramic engineering. And that's usually about the ballpark, somewhere in there. Metallurgical engineering tends to sometimes be a little higher, and that's often because one or two students went to ExxonMobil or Chevron or someplace like that and probably got a $100,000 starting salary, right? But uh, in general, the, the, the uh, salaries are great across the board. I, I do want to mention that there's lots of opportunities for co-ops and internships as well. Um, I've had two of my own daughters go through school in this department. And uh, the first one did three co-ops and internships. And the second one, well, we'll see. But uh, she's working on trying to get her second internship right now. You get paid while you're gaining experience. You can actually do a co-op or an internship after your freshman year. That's how hungry these companies are um, to uh, start hiring our students. And I'll have our, our students say a bit more about that uh, here in a minute. Uh, I'm pretty getting pretty close to, to the end of uh, me yammering for a while here, but I do wanna mention there's a lot of support for our students in the department. It helps that this department, metallurgical engineering has been here for 150 years. Okay, I mentioned that earlier and ceramics has been here for about 100 years, okay? Because we have a $17 million endowment in the department. All right, and I'm working on growing that even further. We give out over $300,000 a year in scholarships. That's a lot, okay? And that typically includes about 125,000 in scholarships from professional organizations. So our students belong to a lot of professional organizations or they have access to those organizations, places like the Foundry Education Foundation, uh, Association for Iron and Steel Technology, WAMI, uh, the Southwest American Ceramic Society, and I'm not even mentioning all of them. I just threw a few of them on here. Um, but our students compete very well nationally across the country uh, for these scholarship dollars. In fact, for places like FEF, uh, we tend to get the largest um, uh, scholarship uh, dollars compared to any of the other uh, programs around the country. So we give out a lot of scholarships. That's great, right? That means uh, more dollars for you guys and your parents uh, in their pockets. We have some great students groups. Um, and this is really where I'm going to turn things over to the students here in a minute, but I want to mention all the active student groups we've got in the department. Material Advantage is kind of our overarching student group. We've got an American Foundry Society uh, student group, AFS. Keramos is our ceramic, although all the students can join it, but it's a ceramic-based um, national professional fraternity. Alpha Sigma Mu is our honor society, and all the students can join this from either discipline. That's materials based, material science-based. Gaffer's Guild is our, is our hot glass shop, glass blowing club. Um, we've got a blacksmithing club that makes glassmithing products. And we got a brand new club that just started up a little over a year ago and that's Ceramic Artists of s &T, uh, cast. And I just wanna show a couple of pictures of the student groups in action. Here's the Caramos student group competing in a ceramic mug drop competition at a national uh, meeting. Now we always take about uh, oh, anywhere from 30 to 40 students to a national conference and I don't really care where it is in the country. We've even taken them to Montreal, Canada for a conference before. And uh, so we'll take them there and we'll compete in uh, student uh, based competitions. These are just some students uh, working uh, on some things related to the hot glass shop uh, while they're doing something a little bit different on, uh, on uh, stained glass there in that picture. But this is uh, one of our groups that was at one of the conferences. All right, so there's myself right there and Dr. O'Malley right there and Dr. O'Keefe in the back, but uh, there's a whole bunch of students. I don't remember what year that's from. It's probably from about three years ago, but um, that's us at one of the conferences after the competition. Our students win a lot of national awards, right? We compete against the biggest schools in the country. So you'll see us be a student kind of speaking competition and we're competing against Northwestern University and Carnegie Mellon University and University of California, Berkeley and wherever and uh, you know we uh, we win some of those competitions so these are our students just out having fun right this was i think a laser tag a uh, laser tag event so a lot of the things that the students do will just be a little things to get together and socialize just a couple more pictures from the hot glass shop and we'll run through a video of uh, students uh, making product in the hot glass shop, but they'll learn to blow glass. Some of them become really expert glass blowers in their spare time and they learn to make a lot of products and then sell that, uh, sell those products to put money back into the process 
for the next students to come along. And uh, this is just one of the products from the, from the blacksmithing uh, club. And uh, these are just some students, probably on an open uh, foundry day. It, it, it might be a research-based pour, though. It looks like steel. But, um, but anyway, this, we do have an open foundry. Um, and I've got an open foundry video that we can show you guys as well. So I'm going to end there for now. And um, I'm going to let the students, uh, Katie, Nathan, Will, Noah, what do you guys want to do? You want me to run through the videos? First, or do you just want to tell the students a little bit about your own experience here? Uh, I'd be I'd be good with going through the foundry video first, if you don't mind. Okay, Nathan, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, I don't sorry, I showed up a few minutes late. I was finishing up work. Uh, I'm Nathan. I'm one of the seniors in the metallurgical engineering department, uh, and I've worked with Katie plenty as well. Um, I do a lot of undergrad research on campus. So that's, that's kind of my thing. Can you guys see this okay? Nathan, is that showing up all right? You seeing that? Yeah, I can see that fine. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start it if you wanna say anything along the way. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. So this video is uh, showing one of our open foundry days. Uh, at least once a semester, we talk about, uh, we kind of open it up to the public and let people come in and make pieces. So you're seeing they're using uh, aluminum. We like to recycle that a lot for these open foundry days. So a lot of that is the remnants of previous casts that we've done for open foundry days. We like to recycle that as much as we can. Uh, and so we have people come in and it'll show it here in a minute, but um, we really like to emphasize showing the community what we do with this. And so here we're cutting foam pieces for people to shape. Um, and for these open foundry days, you don't have to be part of the department. You can show up, cut a piece, and we will put them into sand molds and cast them for you and kind of sh show you a little bit of the process. So, uh, yeah, right now the video is just showing people shape and molds. Uh, this is an event that we like to do uh, at least once a semester um, through AFS, our Boundary Society. And so here you're going to start seeing people packing in their sand molds. Uh, we use green sand, uh, which is also a highly recyclable sand, um, which it's, it's one of the easiest ways to make a lot of these molds really quickly. Um, so you're gonna watch people pack in these molds here. Um, I don't have a whole lot of commentary about packing sand in. Uh, they're probably gonna pick up some rams here. There we go. Um, to really compact the sand, because surprisingly uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of force put on uh, these molds with the metal getting poured in. Even though it's just molten, it still is metal. Uh, so they're carving channels here as a way to let the metal, we, we like to have one central sprue. That's kind of the area that you pour the metal into. And so this is a way to cut some channels so that we can have one central sprue for our uh, for our casters to pour into rather than having to pour into five or six because as soon as you're taking this out of the furnace it's going to start cooling quickly and you want to get it into the molds as fast as possible safety is really important uh you'll see in pretty much all these videos we like to have a lot of safety equipment on um, it can it can be dangerous in the foundry which is why we try and make sure that we take everything as seriously as possible and so you'll see here that pouring is actually a three-person process. Uh, two people to hold uh, the ladle up and keep it steady. And one person to tip and pour uh, the metal in. What you're seeing here uh, with them taking that stick was just taking that slag, that oxide layer off the top of the molten metal. And then here's a pour. And so you'll see weights on top of these molds. Again, that's because there's a lot of pressure going into these molds. It is molten metal. And I can't remember if this video features steam coming out the side, but that's just the styrofoam evaporating. Yeah. <laughs> and so 
so usually these are fun events. Uh, we do this for a majority of the day and between setup and cleanup, it is an all day event. Uh, it's really nice. It gives a lot of people in the department a lot of experience. Usually we try and get everybody to do at least a four during the day. Um, a lot of, it, it's a pretty enjoyable process and it just gives you more experience in the foundry. There's yeah, so there's this there's the steam that Katie was talking about. That is the styrofoam evaporating out of the molds. So here's uh, once the molds have cooled, once we've given enough time for the parts to solidify, they go into this shaker, which shakes the sand out of the mold, breaks it out. Uh, the metal is still extremely hot, so it's going to get quenched in a water bath, um, just so that we're able to start working with the parts quicker. Uh, we put the sand in this partly also so that we can recycle it. Um, like I mentioned, green sand is extremely useful in that it is extremely recyclable. Uh, some of the green sand that we've had in the foundry, you can use for well over a decade easily. I think some of it in there now is currently at that state. Um, you're seeing some uh, percussive engineering here to break <laughs> the pieces off. Um, and so they're still extremely hot. You'll see they're working with gloves there. And uh, I think that wraps it up. I don't know if they show it at all, but afterwards, typically the parts are sandblasted. The the, uh, the sprues are cleaned up off of them so that the people get the, the parts that they kind of carved out. And so that's just that's just one of the things that we pour. Uh, we do that fairly often because it's fairly easy to do aluminum pours, especially for the public. Um, but with our closed foundry days, you'll also see us doing things like we've cast steel in the past, um, cast some brass before, uh, a little bit of bronze. That you get a lot of experience in lab, especially casting different types of metal. Uh, but that's just a little bit of a taste of it. And it looks like we've got the glass shop video up. So I'm gonna hand this over to the ceramics here. Okay, I'll just mention real quick, you know, just to hit that point again, is that, that foundry is largely a research-based foundry, right? So there's millions of dollars a year flowing through our university um, to develop new lightweight steel alloys, as an example. We just got a huge, we actually got a 20 plus million dollar uh, program from the army. So $4 million a year uh, for the next five years um, to help the Army uh, develop a new lightweight uh, material for Army applications, all right? But the students, you know, all, you know, work in there too, right? And they're, they're learning how to do the foundry for part of the teaching labs, you know, and then they, uh, they basically run these events like these open foundry days. But there's, you just got to keep in mind, there's graduate students in there trying to do, you know, PhD level uh, research as well. And so uh, it's a great synergy. Um, you know, to see that kind of kind of thing in action. There's a lot of juggling that has to happen, you know, for the students all to, to get the access that they need uh, for the foundry activities. And we're one of the few places in the country that still has a working foundry um, at a university setting. So, uh, yeah, uh, Will or Noah, I don't know who wants to go through this, but um, I'm, I'm going to show the uh, ceramic video, the hot glass shop. You guys ready? This video has commentary, so I don't know how much to add to it. <laughs> oh, that's true. It does, doesn't it? Each one is slightly different. They may, we try to, let's say a series of, of uh, pieces like this, we try to make them close together, but each one. I'll just stop, pause real quick. This is Dr. Reedmeyer, and it says there, she's a teaching professor emeritus. Dr. Reedmeyer taught in this department for many, many years, and she's the one that started this hot glass shop, and she still runs it today, even though she's retired. It has a little bit of its own personality. I've always been really creative, and so making things and figuring out how to solve problems is something that I really enjoyed. Nope. 
Yeah, get them to longer uh, on that boil so they can you know, There's a little bit of different learning between the lecture and, and the lab. Uh, the lecture we focus more on the technical side, but it's applied to, I call the three typical blast systems that you see in studio glass. But the same technical, you know, when you look at thermal expansion, thermal shock, mechanical properties, all, all that technical side. Um, we come over to the shop, now we're really experiencing it. You know, that we're working with the glass, we're seeing what the viscosity is like, we're understanding if I let it cool down too much, the stress is going to extreme the strength of the material and it breaks. And you actually see it, it really happens. So this is really seeing it applied. The chemistry was was good because for me, coming from um, my artist background, I was starting to get into the chemistry of things, but didn't really know very much. So a lot of the things that I saw, the reactions that I saw happening with uh, something like the glazes or the the refractories within the furnaces, started really making sense connecting the chemistry. Basically, the students are in class now will very likely be instructors two or three semesters from now. So they get to share, they get to share what they learned. They're going to teach the next group of students that come in. I can get pretty temperamental when I'm uh, making things. Uh, but understanding the fact that when you set out to make something, you're going to fail about 90% of the time. And and then probably really not be satisfied with the majority of what you're doing. So just really understanding that it's going to take time to build the skills and get to the point where you want to be. So with SMT and salon classes and grades and tests and home and math, math, science, math, and then this you don't have to think about any of that. And you don't you do have to think because if you don't think of it hurt. But it's a lot of focus that's not school based. And so it helps like release the stress and the tension of worrying about all the other things happening and I can just do this one thing for a while. My students very often will come to me and they'll go, Can we do this? And if it's like, I don't think they'll break the equipment, no one's going to get hurt, I'm like, try it. We'll find out how it works. I mean, we're engineers. And so we're not constrained by, I call this hearsay about whether you can or can't do something. It's like, well, think through it. Does this make sense to try to do it? So we try to do it. I think it's a fantastic thing for students to really get to, before they leave school, to try to apply some of the things that they've learned. You know, and it's whether it's the technical, you know, I say back at the viscosity of the glass, or whether it's just like when they're coming in as TAs or supervisors that they have responsibilities, sometimes they have to tell people no. It's the kind of what I call management skills that companies, you know, that companies are looking for. One thing to note that she said at the end is like, if students come to her and say, oh, I have an idea to do this, she's not joking. I know two years ago, they were quenching glass in snow because we had a lot of it. Um, like, it's not a joke. She will do what you wanna do if, as long as it's safe for the students. And obviously it didn't work. Um, the glass shattered <laughs> in the bucket of the snow, but they definitely tried it and they made a handful of different types of things. It's always neat to see what comes from the glass shop. I've not technically worked like done work in the glass shop. I've done more of the technical research glass, but um, glass shop's really cool. You get to express your artistic side similar to cast. Um, they're doing it with clay base material. So slip casting clay using a potter's wheel. It's all the artistic side of um, ceramic engineering, but you get to actually, you know, the properties and why things actually work. Whereas you take an art class and you're kind of just doing it. Uh, this gives you the experience to actually know why things work they do the way they do and getting hands-on really helps learn why like understand the material in classes because I know I learn better hands-on and so getting to work with glass in labs and in the hot shop you really get to understand the viscosity of glass because you pour it and it's like the forbidden honey that you shouldn't touch but you want to but we don't um, <laughs> but it's definitely something that you learn hands-on and you can understand it better yeah 
um, something that I certainly will say that this department gives you in spades is a lot of hands-on experience. Um, from what I've heard in other programs, it's um, lab classes aren't, I would say that um, one thing unique to our department's labs is that um, it uses a module system to give you um, lots of experience in different sections of ceramic engineering. For example, this semester, I'm currently in a sintering module, and I will go through a hot pressing and a mechanical processes module. This whole sy system is set up to give you a lot of uh, hands-on experience with uh, researching and presenting uh, your findings. And all these modules typically lick link up with a corresponding course that you will take throughout your degree. So the, the lab experience builds uh, upon um, the knowledge you'll get in classes. I'm sitting here looking at the chat. I think we've got most of the stuff answered there for now, but uh, you know, we can reach out again if your question hasn't been answered. You know, I'll just hit a couple of things real quick just to make sure we cover some things and then I'm gonna go right back to the students. You know, is double majoring common at Missouri S&T? Yeah, I've certainly seen a lot of students over my 23 years double major. When I say a lot, it may be a, a few percent of the students in our department. All right, so it's it's not that common, but I mean, it does it does occur. Um, we've had students do, I've had seen students have done ceramic engineering and electrical engineering. And, you know, we've had a couple of students that have done ceramic and metallurgy. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not that common. Average class sizes, you know, in our department anyway, are probably on the order of 20 to 40 students uh, at most in a class. Um, there are a couple of common classes that are across both metallurgy and ceramics. So say a thermodynamics class might have, you know, 50 or 60 students in it, uh, but that's pretty rare. And the classes can be as small as five. Um, we do do REU programs occasionally. We're not running an REU right now. That's a research experience for undergraduates uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. We've had several of them over the years, particularly in, in additive manufacturing. If you know anything about you know, additive manufacturing, we're actually doing a lot of that in the department. Uh, we're making both ceramics and metals. I've got a couple of parts here. This is a titanium aluminum vanadium alloy, right? And this is a Hastelloy alloy made by additive manufacturing. All right, so our metallurgy faculty are doing that. There's a ceramic part. A little tough to see, but this is a zirconia, zirconium dioxide gear. We're also doing biomaterials. This is a 3D biomedical implant, right? Made out of a bioglass. And these were both made by additive manufacturing. So those are neat areas uh, of research. And again, we have done REUs in that area, but we don't have any REUs running right now. But there are other research experiences. If a student wants to just come and work, you know, we can set you up with working with a faculty member. Faculty want to hire students all the time. Um, the only minor we have in the department is biomedical engineering. That's just in the department, right? But uh, you can get a um, uh, lots of other minors uh, across campus. So I'll monitor this and see uh, what other questions we've got. But uh, again, it looks like everybody's handled these pretty well. Katie, you want to take a few minutes and maybe tell the students, you know, why you chose metallurgical engineering? You know, what brought you, what brought you to us? Yeah, sure thing. So I actually in high school knew I wanted to go into engineering, but I was definitely leaning towards something chemistry based. So I was looking particularly into um, nuclear chemical engineering or material science. And so what really sold me on the department was I actually came here for a summer camp after my junior year of high school, or actually no after my sophomore year. And um, that one was the material science and engineering camp and so it was really cool because we got to spend a week learning about both departments ceramic and metallurgy and so i just fell in love with like just studying the microstructures learning how they like determine the mechanical properties and um, it was just really fascinating to me and like dr Hilma said everything's a material i mean everything's made of something and it's just it fascinated me to look at something and wonder you know why does it behave the way it does and now I'm able to like look at parts in industry and like I really enjoy failure analysis. And so understanding why something broke just looking at the microstructure is really interesting for me. 
And so that definitely was one of the things that led me to the department and like getting to meet some of the staff during that week was really important too. So I got to meet um, who's now my advisor, uh, Dr. Miller, who ran the camp and um, Dr. Motes, I think came and presented as well, who specializes in extracting copper. So it was really, really influential. And so, yeah, if you're interested in chemistry and application, this is definitely the place for you. That's great. Noah, how about you? What brought you to ceramics? Uh, my experience is very different. I had no idea what I wanted to do going out of high school. So I actually, I'm actually a transfer student uh, from a different university. So I started my schooling at University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg, Missouri. Um, in a biology degree because I knew I liked biology and I loved math. So I tried to get my stuff together and figure out what I wanted to do with my life, but it's a hard thing to do. So I uh, went around a few states around us in Missouri and like looked at different schools, see what they had in the engineering field because I knew I liked math and science. Came to Missouri s and and they have, like I am doing a biomedical engineering minor. And so I talked to Dr. Miller actually, or Dr. Eber, one of the two, um, showed me around campus, showed me around the department, showed me just how broad of a degree ceramic engineering is, because you would think it's like, it's a pretty niche, like not many schools actually have ceramic engineering as a degree. But once you get into it, you see how broad the degree actually is and how many different directions you, you can go. You can work in uh, technical ceramics classes, you can work in clays, traditional uh, ceramics. There's so many different varieties of it. and you it allows you to separate yourself from different students and really find jobs that way. Like I know um, I've done research in uh, ultra high temp ceramics with Dr. Hilmus's group actually, uh, working on a composite material that is used for friction stir welding of steel materials. And then I've also been doing research, a collaboration between a national laboratory and then the class group here, working on slow crack growth of uh, glass fibers to like understand it better. So I like getting two different realms of it is really nice. Um, but knowing that these opportunities are there is really helpful because going to a school and not knowing that you can actually do things to help set yourself apart from other students isn't nice. But knowing that s and actually helps you separate yourself in a way that you're not just a basic engineer, you're, you are a ceramic engineer or a metallurgy engineer with background and research and all these different types of things really helps to get you a job or get you in a, a grad school to further your education. It really helped me at least. So Noah, you're going to do what? You're staying here, right? I will be. <laughs> yes, I've done five years of school because of my transfer, but I'm going to go longer because I want to be smarter. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of our students do go on to grad school. It's uh, it's not a it's not a requirement or anything like that. Of course, I mean, the, again, the, the job market is great at the bachelor's level. I've been fielding some questions about the five five year BSMS uh, program. I'm I'm going to shoot straight with you guys, and I'll tell you that I'm not a big fan of it. If a student really wants to get a a five year you know BSMS, um, I think that's great. You know, um, just keep in mind. One of the neat things about engineering in general, and it's very, very true in material science engineering because of all the research that we have. If you wanted to get an MS degree, we'll pay for it. All right, that's how much research we've got going in the department. It would take you about a year and a half to get a master's degree. Some students, it takes a little longer. It might take them two years, okay? But you know, 18 months to two years. Um, now, understanding if you just want to go straight through and get a BSMS in five years, that's fantastic. You're out in five years, you got your master's degree. It's a non-thesis master's though. You're not going to have done any research, but you will have that degree, you know, tagged there. But uh, most of the companies I would say are still looking for research-based master's uh, folks. And again, uh, because we have so much research going, if you want to go on to graduate school, Right now, graduate student stipends are being are paying about $25,000 a year, plus the faculty member in our department typically always pay the full tuition for the students. All right, so it's very rare that they that they don't. So you basically would be getting free tuition and $25,000 a year uh, to go to graduate school. So once you're done your bachelor's degree, you know, your parents are off the hook to pay any, you know, be shelling out any money. And so to me, that's that's the better deal. So I'm just telling you the same thing I would tell my own kids. 
Do we take grad students that have ME undergraduate degrees? Yes. Yes, we do. Um, typically, when we take a student from any other discipline, though, to go to grad school, um, they probably got to do a little bit of remedial work. All right, because I mean, they're missing some basic background. They're going to go get a master's degree. And that's not so necessary, right? Because we don't have the big hurdles that we have for the PhD program. But to get them through the qualifying exam for the PhD, uh, that's a different story. Then you've got to get some more of that background. Nathan, Will, you got anything you guys want to add about your experiences, you know, coming here to Missouri? Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about that. First, I do want to expand a little bit on one of the questions I was in the chat about taking classes outside of the major. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when you start getting to, uh, once you start getting towards your technical electives, you do have a lot of flexibility. There are classes that are suggested and usually they have to deal with the interplay between uh, metallurgy and ceramics, just because that gives a bit more of a, a more comprehensive perspective. But it's not uncommon to try and push out of department for another class that might be rel relevant. Um, I've done composites courses for mechanical engineers. Um, I'm taking a non-destructive testing course that's geared towards electrical engineers. There's a lot of flexibility in it. Um, and really it just comes down to what you're interested in, what you think will help with your education. Um, usually the advisors are pretty flexible with that and just want to see you uh, really grow and flourish in the way that you want to within the department. So there is a lot of flexibility in that regard, uh, which I appreciate. So uh, my, me coming to um, my journey to s and so um, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually a, the second student in my family to come here. My older brother has, uh, not for material science, but I, the school was on my radar already. Um, similar to Katie, I was pretty interested in chemistry. Um, that's kind of where my background comes from. And so I, I had a pretty vested interest in chemistry and just being able to physically apply it was my interest, which led to material science. Uh, coming here, I did tour here. And one of the big things that was highlighted, um, and it's one of my favorite parts of the department is that there's almost equal emphasis to both theory and practice. That was something that I noticed, especially while I was touring here and especially through my degree, I can vouch for as well. Um, we almost always have a course that corresponds with a lab in the same semester so that you're learning the theory and then applying it practically. Um, so there was just a lot of interest there. Um, I do also have a vested interest in corrosion, which as Dr. Hilmus mentioned, we are fairly good with. Um, so it, it all just kind of made sense in that regard, which is how I ended up here. But you, Will. Um, as Nathan and Katie both said, um, I, in high school, I took three years of chemistry and um, like Katie, I attended a summer camp. Um, I didn't attend the materials camp. I attended the, um, Jackling intro to engineering camp, uh, which was led by one of these uh, ceramic professors, Dr. Hebner. And through that, um, I got to visit, visit five different departments. I actually ended up visiting both the metallurgy and the ceramic department. And I, I chose ceramics because um, one, I had not heard much about ceramics in high school chemistry and they seemed appealing to me and I stuck with it because I have found that the interplay between um, chemical composition and uh, properties of material has been really interesting for me. Um, as a student, um, one way I've gotten involved in the department is um, as Dr. Hilmus had mentioned earlier, the Karamos Honors Fraternity. I'm actually currently the national student representative for the organization. And I uh, think it's a wonderful organization because it attempts to do something similar to what we're doing tonight, reaching out to students and inspiring interest in material science. Um, I think this department has a lot of heart and it's, it's kept me here. It's a great department. We're the best department on campus. 
<laughs> you can ask just about anybody. I mean, I say that and I'm not joking. It's a, it really is a great department. It's a, I got a very home like feel to it. Uh, the faculty get along great. The students get along great and uh, really enjoy uh, spending time with each other. And uh, because we're not a huge department, we really get to know the students. There's upsides and downsides to that. You know, if Noah doesn't show up for my class, which I don't think has ever happened, I would know. All right. And I'd probably go back to my office and send Noah a note, you know, Noah, how come you weren't in my class today? Um, but, um, you know, there's lots of upsides to it as well, because you really do get to, to know the students and they really do get to know the, the faculty as well. So there's still things we probably don't know about each other. Like Will probably doesn't know that I was the national president of Caramos, you know, at one point in time. So. <laughs> and all I really mean to say there is Caramos has meant a lot to me uh, over my time as well. These student organizations, um, a lot of the students go on and, and carry that on with them uh, in their engineering career and pass that on to others. And uh, that's another great thing, um, you know, that happens by our students uh, getting involved. You know, you can see I brought four students on this call. It wasn't a challenge. It's never a challenge to get students to sign up uh, to come join on these kinds of events. Or to join, you know, back when we're, we're, we're past the COVID-19 world, they'll be back in the lab doing demos um, because we bring a lot of students through the department. And uh, the, really the way we get students hooked into the department is we show them all the demos. One of the beauties of our, our field, if you know, you've got some of a sense for it by looking at the hot glass shop and the, and the foundry video is we're just very hands on. Right. So if you're into hands on, you know, learning, um, that's that's what we do. You know, and again, there's a chemistry aspect to it, but there's also, uh, you know, a physics aspect to it. I joined material science because I loved the chemistry side of things. But in reality, most of what I do these days is physics. You know, I teach thermal and mechanical properties of ceramics, and it's all about it's all about the physics. And uh, so we teach you both. You know, chemistry and physics are great fields, but when you start to apply them in engineering, you start to make products, you know, that make the world better. Um, that's really what we're about. You know, developing new materials that really make life uh, easier and better uh, for folks. That's material science in a nutshell. And I uh, see Kara's come on and she probably wants to tell us we better take any last questions. Well, and I actually had one. So I, oh, wanted, awesome. <laughs> I wanted to ask if you could just talk a little bit about how biomedical engineering fits in with material science. And if a student was interested in minoring in biomedical engineering because they were interested in material science, how that would play out for them if that's their interest? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're based, with, as with any minor uh, here uh, at, at the university, you know, there's basically a set number of credit hours. It's usually 15 hours uh, that you've got to take. Um, there will certainly be biology classes you know, that have to be taken as part of that, but we also have you know, biomaterials and biomedical engineering classes uh, on the campus. Um, and so we have a new faculty member in the department, Dr. Anthony Convertine, who's only been here for uh, about three years now, maybe not quite three years. And uh, he's teaching our intro to biomedical engineering class. And along with the faculty in biology and, and chemistry and other places that work in, in biomaterials, you know, they're all kind of co-teaching other classes as well. Um, but, you know, the way that fits in is, is, look, you know, biomaterials is just another growing area of materials research, right? As, as material scientists look to make the world better with new materials, I think, you know, the, the things that the breakthroughs that we're going to have in the bio, in the intersection of biology and medicine is going to be huge. Um, you know, we have a, a former faculty member, I shouldn't say former, he's retired, he's an emeritus faculty member now, but Dr. Day, you know, he has a company here in Rolla, Missouri that makes glass products for the for the biomaterials field. He makes glass products for other things as well. Um, but his main glass product was a glass bead for the treatment of liver cancer. And while it took him years to develop that product, you know, and get it approved by the FDA, uh, he developed all sorts of other glass products. But that product is now being used in hundreds of hospitals around the world. And you probably don't know it, but you probably have glass from Rolla, Missouri, from Mosai Corporation in your vehicles, in your cars. And you probably, if you've ever had a cavity uh, that's been filled uh, using the light cured, the light cured polymer filling where they shine the little blue light in there, you probably have glass beads from Mosai Corporation in your mouth. Um, so this is a great company. Um, they make a lot of, make a lot of products and uh, we hope to spin off more of that kind of stuff here in the future in this area. I think that's going to be a really, a really growing hot area for you know, the next hundred years. I hope that answered your question, Kara. 
there's always lots of interest in it. So it's, it's always great to, to get your input on that. Thank you. But yes, anyone has questions, now's the time as we're rounding up the end of our session here. Yeah, I've got maybe a couple more things in the chat. Looks like we've handled them all. Um, uh, I've got somebody that's mentioned they've got a daughter uh, getting an MA degree with coatings and polymers, starting to look for grad schools. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me at uh, G Hilmas, uh, G H I L M A S at mst.edu. And um, I would put your daughter in touch then with Mike Motes, who's my associate chair for graduate studies. Um, but you know, you can search me on the material science and engineering department website, you know, I'm the department chair, uh, mse.mst.edu. And uh, we're accepting applications for graduate students all the time. Um, I'll mention this, uh, this department was doing about two and a half million dollars a year in research about five years ago. We did five and a half million this year and we'll probably do 10 million next year. So that's how fast the research uh, has been growing in the department. And so uh, we're in dire need of graduate students. And undergraduates, we love undergraduate students. Noah will tell you, every time I walk into class, I go, thank God you guys are here. It's the highlight of my week. <clears throat> Any last questions for us? I should put my email in the chat real quick. Be a little bit easier. I'll also just throw out there for the potential graduate students out there, if you haven't heard of the Cummer Vanguard uh, scholarship opportunity, we're looking for 100 new grad students every year who are gonna be fully supported. Uh, by this Cummer Vanguard Scholars Program. Uh, it's on the website. It's K-U-M-M-E-R, Cummer Vanguard Scholarship. Uh, so we're super excited about it. It's going to bring a lot more grad students to S&T with a lot of good funding. So we're excited yeah. about that. That's great. Thanks for, thanks for thinking of that. All right. Any last comments, Noah? Nathan, Will, Katie, did I miss anything? Tell them how great life in Rolla is. Oh, well. <laughs> What'd you say? It's it's small town, but there's plenty to do everywhere in Rolla. <laughs> One thing I was going to uh, mention: someone asked if how to get jobs, uh, like like internships and co-ops. Uh, the career fair is definitely helpful at, at, like when I was at UCM, the career fair was maybe a hundred companies here. It's ginormous compared, like we fill up two gyms and it's still very close. Usually <laughs> um, about 230 to 250 companies. Yeah, somewhere it's there for each one of the quite large, yeah. um, but also in our department, our senior design pairs with companies sometimes. So we have a sponsor. So my senior design is actually working with NASA on a project. And so every other week I'm in communication with a NASA representative and sometimes uh, the senior design projects can pair you with a job if you perform well enough that the sponsor really likes your work. So that's another way of helping you get a job. That's more so like a full-time job afterwards since you're in your senior year, but career fair is definitely for internships and co-ops. Yeah, that career fair size that Noah mentioned, because it's in the chat here, just uh, is is for the whole career fair. So 230 you know, companies or so are typically somewhere in that range, 250. And that's for the virtual ones. The in-person ones, once we have those again, are over 300. Over 300. 31 mm -hmm. for the in-person. Yeah, so we're down a little bit, but you're right. They're over. They're typically over 300 these days on the, in the in-person ones. But the number that the question for material science, I would say normally there's probably about when I combine ceramics and metallurgy together, there's probably about 60 companies at the big open career fairs. The virtual one was a little bit smaller, but we also still get a lot of just through the department. You know, they won't even come to the career fair. They just send a note, you know, or they'll come and say, you know, hey, I'm coming next week and I want to interview students, please set me up. You know, so we'll still get companies that'll do that. I mean, even big companies like GE Aviation will come and say, I want to come in two weeks and I want to interview 20 students, you know, set me up, you know, so, um, so there's still a lot of that. It's interesting when you go to the career fair here, because really we're talking to our alumni. They, they send a few human resources folks, but most of the who you would talk to at our career fair are the metallurgical and ceramic engineering alum. 
then that's who's coming back to hire more of our students. And that's great. So we get to see our alumni all the time. You know, they're passionate about, about what they do. And I think that's neat. Up with is I really appreciate while we do have a large department, it is still small enough that like Katie is one of like a group of eight people that I've seen in almost every single one of my classes, or I've had at least a couple classes every semester with since sophomore year. Uh, you really do get to know a lot of the department and a lot of the people in it. And it's, it's a fairly tight knit community, which is really, really nice. Um, that's honestly one of the things that I appreciate the most about the department. No, that's great. You know, I convinced, I think I mentioned it earlier, I convinced two of my own kids to, to go here and they're both in ceramic engineering. So there you go. <clears throat> Didn't take much convincing. Any students right. participate in a student design team? I'll just ask real quick before we wrap up. Yeah, uh, Katie and I are at, were last year actually the two head people of concrete canoe design team. Um, it's not necessarily a ceramic, but we're trying to overwhelm it with more ceramics, which we've done in the past, but it's a civil based uh, design team, but she was the captain and I was the chief engineer. So she headed the team and I headed the technical side of things. And we may have looked like outside the department sort of situation, but we're overwhelming it and more people should join it because it's really fun. <laughs> Yeah, and it's definitely not a metallurgy design team, but I've really enjoyed getting to meet, you know, people in other majors and like get to, you know, just expand my knowledge base. And like, I really love the mechanical engineering aspect of it, you know, designing the actual canoe. And so it's fun to just stick my foot in some other pool, you know, just do something else. Yeah, that's another beauty here. I mean, you know, students can do that and they can get involved with the Student Design Center and, you know, go join any team, you know. And I've even helped these teams out some over the years, you know, with various aspects of the of the work they need to do. And that's been that's been a lot of fun. So I like to see our students taking over the concrete new team. Concrete's a ceramic. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> in a lot of ways. That was my excuse with it. That's but right. really, you can join any type of design team. I know uh, ceramics that are on, oh gosh, human powered vehicle. Like I know a lot of that are on just different design teams that you wouldn't necessarily place a material engineer, but it gives you really good opportunities to work with a team outside of like labs and whatnot. It's a larger team, which looks really good when you're applying for jobs. Um, a lot of companies worked on a design team when they were in school, like the, the representative worked on a design team when they were in school, or they understand that that's similar to the team that you would be working with in the company. And they take that not lightly. They really like that you've worked on the design team. They really like that our department has labs and whatnot. It's just very good <laughs> to get involved. It's not just good on uh, applications for jobs either. It's just, it's a lot of fun. It's a good experience. And then on top of that, it, uh, it gives you a lot, a lot different of perspective because uh, like they mentioned, we don't really have an official design team in department. That's probably because uh, Dr. Helm has touched on it earlier, but if it exists, they need materials in some capacity. And so like I've done a little bit of work with Mars Rover. Um, I haven't worked with them directly, but I've gotten, I've fielded quite a few questions for the rocket team on campus. You know, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved anywhere, any of the design teams. Uh, I know a lot of metallurgists also work on the steel bridge team. That's a pretty popular one. Um, and so it, it really is a good experience just to kind of diversify and learn another skill set. 